This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I'm Warren Gasper. I'm one of the uh, faculty here at UCSF and at the VA, and uh, I'm going to sort of uh, give a little bit of uh, sort of a nuts and bolts talk on vascular testing. Uh, luckily, Dr. Bandick kind of um, covered a lot of the territory that I'm going to cover, so that will hopefully speed us up a little bit, get us to um, the sort of exciting debates that are coming up sooner. Um, no disclosures. Uh, so. This is actually not the same patient that Dr. Bandick showed you. This is somebody else. But um, critical limb ischemia, I mean, just to sort of these global terms that we're using, uh, you know, we characterize it by ischemic rest pain, tissue loss, either non-healing ulceration or gangrene. Uh, the prognosis, as we've heard from, from the speakers this morning, there's a high risk of limb loss, but there's also a high risk of cardiovascular events. Uh, and so vascular testing in critical limb ischemia becomes important, I think, in sort of three domains. So the first is, is this CLI? Um, uh, you know, somebody has wounds on their feet, uh, do they, and they're diabetic, is it necessarily critical limb ischemia? Uh, the next thing is, is a situation like this, uh, you know, is this actually going to heal? Uh, could we do some testing to, to come up with some uh, better prognostic abilities? And, uh, and then finally, you know, how do we avoid something like this? Somebody who uh, had, a, say, a, a TMA in a critical limb ischemia situation, um, and then they come back, um, you know, in a, sort of a worse ischemic state. Uh, so we could start with a little quiz. Which of the following tests is best suited uh, to predict the healing potential of a patient with peripheral artery disease and an ulcer on the great toe? Uh, a CTA? Uh, sorry, contrast angiography, a CTA, TCPO2, or a three-phase bone scan. All right, great. So you make my job even easier. Like I said, this is kind of nuts and bolts. This is not anything that you haven't heard before, but um, maybe a couple of new things. So. In terms of thinking about the different methods for assessing arterial insufficiency, we have these hemodynamic measurements, uh, the ABI, the TBI, segmental Doppler pressures, and pulse volume recordings, which um, I think in the modern vascular lab are used less frequently now. Um, then there's tissue perfusion measurements, uh, TCPO2, skin perfusion pressure, and then uh, endocyanin green angiography. As Dr. Bandick mentioned, there's a couple ones that are, are new, the, the hyper, um, uh, the spec scanning and the, in these other uh, sort of uh, perfusion measurements that haven't quite made it out of uh, the lab yet, so I'm not going to really talk about them. Uh, and then finally, there's the anatomic imaging, uh, duplex, CTA, MRA, or angiography. Uh, so, you know, workhorse for our medical students is the ankle brachial index. Um, we, you know, it's easily done at the bedside. Um, you can use cutoffs, obviously 0.9 for the just diagnosis of PAD. Um, use cutoffs of 0.4 for severe arterial insufficiency. Um, and CLI, as we saw, you know, has been defined as uh, less than 50 millimeter ankle pressure um, in the case of tissue loss, or less than 70, I, I'm sorry, less than 50 in the case of rest pain, or less than 70 in the case of tissue loss. And, um, you know, the, the one point that we always make is that you take the highest of the two arms and the highest of the ankle pressure, uh, and that's your ABI. But of course, in this population, in the CLI population with the high prevalence of diabetes, it's often limited uh, because of tibial artery calcification. You get a falsely elevated um, uh, ankle pressure, uh, and so toe pressure becomes very attractive. Uh, the 
Um, incidence of digital artery calcification is very low, even in diabetics and renal failure patients. Um, you basically, the cuff is on the toe. You can either use a photoplethysmography or a Doppler probe uh, with a little toe cuff. And again, CLI definitions have used the toe pressures with an absolute toe pressure of uh, 30 for uh, rest pain or 50 for tissue loss. Um, it also is relatively quick. Um, it, it has, uh, for the toe brachial index, it has slightly different criteria. So 0.7 and higher is what we typically use uh, as normal. Uh, if it's less than 0.2, which I mean typically that's going to be a toe pressure of about 30, um, assuming they have a relatively normal uh, blood pressure, then um, that's going to be sort of more in the severe PAD or CLI uh, uh, area. Of course, the disadvantage is that you do need the toe cuffs and you also do need a toe. Um, and, you know, these are the sorts of measurements that you routinely get from a vascular lab. I think um, it's quite uh, helpful to actually look at these waveforms um, because this can often help you uh, distinguish whether you have a falsely elevated uh, ankle brachial index. In this case, this patient has uh, normal ABIs, so 1.2 basically on both sides, and you can see that there's a nice triphasic waveform um, on the PPG and, you know, in both the posterior tibial dorsalis pedis. Uh, then at the level of the digit, there's, you know, relatively quick upstroke here. Uh, and then, you know, just as a point of comparison, this is somebody who on the left side has, again, pretty normal waveforms, um, you know, and so I'd say they probably have a pretty believable ankle brachial index and toe brachial index, although, I mean, the tech didn't get the best thing here. But if you look and compare that to the right side, you see a relatively blunted waveform here, slower uptake uh, <clears throat> in the uh, waveform, and then uh, in the actual digit measurement, actually having trouble picking up a good waveform. Uh, and, you know, they estimated the toe pressure here at about 34. Uh, and so, uh, you know, certainly if you see somebody uh, with an, an ABI um, that looks normal uh, by the numbers, but then has a waveform that looks like this, that sort of is your tip off that this is actually a heavily calcified artery. So moving forward to more of the perf perfusion measurements, we've got TCPO2, which has been around for quite a while. Um, you know, basically these electrodes are placed on the skin. Uh, they uh, heat the skin a little bit and uh, measure basically the concentration of oxygen. So why is that important? It's because it really, it's a measurement of oxygen tension that's really more of a metabolic measurement. So this isn't very useful for a mild or moderate PAD patient because uh, there's such an oversupply of oxygen that their TCPO2 numbers are gonna be high. It's really in the severely limited inflow where there starts to become an imbalance between supply and demand. Uh, and what is sort of one of those, the thing to sort of take home to remember about this is that somebody who has a reading of zero doesn't mean that they have no flow. It just means that all of their oxygen is being consumed. So, you know, there's such a high demand for the oxygen that this probe is just not picking up any of it. Uh, in terms of interpreting the TCPO2 values, over 55 or so is typically normal. Uh, over 40 is likely to heal a wound, less than 10, or in the case of the Wi-Fi criteria, 20, uh, it's unlikely to heal a wound. Um, and looking at the advantages and disadvantages, I mean, uh, it, it again, it's been validated, its use in critical limb ischemia has been uh, shown and is used in, uh, you know, the Wi-Fi criteria, the Rutherford and, um, you know, the nice thing is that the measurements are not affected by arterial calcification. And you can also perform it anywhere, if patients with a TMA, uh, you can do it in a peri-wound area. Uh, the disadvantage is that it can be pretty time intensive. It can take 15 minutes for the probes to uh, equilibrate. Um, there can be some trouble with reproducibility. Uh, and, you know, there's a whole list of different factors can affect your measurements. Uh, edema, cellulitis, sympathetic tone, skin temperature, body temperature, venous pressure, how high their leg is if you elevate it or you drop it down. Um, and so it, it can be difficult to reproduce the numbers just because of all these variables going into it. Uh, you've seen this slide before, and again, this is just sort of the prognostic ability of these different measurements, ankle pressure, toe pressure, TCPO2, and predicting wound healing. 
So moving you know, now to some of these other technologies, skin perfusion pressure, um, this uses a laser Doppler probe. Basically, it looks for moving uh, red blood cells up to about a millimeter and a half below the skin. You put this underneath a blood pressure cuff, you then blow up the blood pressure cuff, and it gives you a skin perfusion pressure. So it essentially is like an ABI or toe pressure. The cuff blows up, and then the probe watches for the, uh, the movement of uh, the red blood cells again, uh, except it's in sort of a microcirculation cutaneous level. Uh, there have been a number of studies to try and look at this and to try and validate it and, and you know, bring it in line with things that we use like toe pressure and ABI. Uh, this group in Japan uh, took 211 patients, 403 limbs, um, you know, a definite sort of uh, population that you'd want to validate this in, 50% diabetic, 20% dialysis dependent, uh, 94, uh, 94 limbs with tissue loss. And uh, they basically compared uh, the skin perfusion to ABI. And you can see part of this is that the ABI is kind of all over the place because these are heavily calcified tibial arteries. It actually correlates pretty well with the toe pressure. The R value for this is over 0.8. Um, TCPO2, again, it's kind of all over the place in part because both of these methods are, are uh, susceptible to the same problems of skin temperature, room temperature. Uh, but based on these, uh, um, Measurements basically they found that when they followed these patients, the patients who healed had on average an SPP of over 48. Um, the ones that did not heal were down around 20. Um, and you look, you know, the, these in terms of their other measurements, the the toe pressures were around 37 for the healed and 14 for the unhealed. So uh, sort of in line with what you we sort of know from other studies. So I think in terms of how to interpret these values. Um, over 50, well, that's probably definitely normal. Less than 30, wound healing is unlikely. Um, exactly what's happening in between, I think it's still difficult to predict. Uh, the advantages, you can do it again at any level. You can put these probes anywhere you want, to TMA, to um, in their independent of arterial calcification. Disadvantages that this has the same problems with reproducibility as TCPO2. Um, Indocyanin green angiography. This is kind of a kind of a different direction. You look at regional perfusion using an intravascular fluorophore. Uh, it basically, indocyanin green is given in through the IV, uh, and then you shine a laser on them. This is in the ultraviolet uh, wavelength, and there's a camera that picks up the fluorescence, and you get a pretty picture. Uh, it has a half-life of about two and a half to three minutes, so it takes about two minutes to gather the data. So it's it's relatively rapid. Uh, and um, the sort of promise of it is that it's operator independent. You'd get reproducible data on regional perfusion at the wound site. Uh, the group from Arizona, as you've seen this picture before, but um, they did this in 13 patients before and after revascularization. And you can see that there's a dramatic, uh, you know, improvement in the perfusion here. Uh, still working out the kinks in terms of what really is meaningful to measure. Is it, you know, the absolute area that's here, the highest area of perfusion, it's still kind of, in, you know, being uh, validated in kind of a phase one, phase two type, type uh, situation, but it's, it's promising as an operator independent uh, perfusion measure. Um, and then, you know, I chose this kind of more of like a mad magazine type depiction of angiosomes. Um, but I think, and I agree with Dr. Bandick, this is, you know, really where I think the next level of vascular testing could go. The, the techniques like TCPO2, skin perfusion pressure, the endocyanin green, uh, all allow for uh, the assessment of individual angiosomes, uh, looking at the angiosomes uh, before a revascularization procedure, after a revascularization procedure, seeing how effective a revascularization procedure was for an individual angiosome. Uh, I think that there's potentially a great benefit um, uh, in that. And then finally, just to look at, at imaging, I mean, as we've heard earlier, the multi-level arterial stenosis is really uh, common. It's sort of the rule in most of these patients. I'd say the first thing to image with is your hands. Um, you know, check for femoral pulses. That can oftentimes lead you in what direction of workup you're gonna need to do. Um, uh, but very often you need some kind of an assessment, either duplex ultrasound, CT or MR, um, of course, gold standard being angiogram uh, to plan the revascularization. 
So in conclusion, toe pressure really right now is the gold standard for non-invasive testing uh, in order to predict wound healing. There's really no single perfect test for assessing foot perfusion, um, but these new perfusion-based technologies uh, it, that could be used in more of an angiosome-directed therapy may be what advances this field. Um, thanks.